What if I told you the world wasn't controlled by a few people? What if I told you the real conspiracy has been in front of your eyes your whole life and everyone's in on it, including you? The world is a complicated place, and no one video or person could explain it. But it's especially confusing because so much of what we're taught about it is misleading, simplistic, and outright wrong, which leaves us susceptible to conspiracy theories and the rabbit holes they lead down. The theories, if you can call them that, claim to explain how things work, but without a lot of evidence. If you actually look at what happens and why, rather than what some guy told you is probably happening, you can learn how power works. If you get some idea how power works, where it's located, how people get it, what they do with it, what incentives it creates, you realize conspiracy theories can't explain things. And you were getting played. I'm Chris, and welcome back to YouTube's Rear End. I'm not going to try and explain and debunk all the conspiracy theories. In the age of computer-generated deep fakes that look and sound exactly like real life, you could get anyone to say anything. And the fake news is wilder than ever. Like all my videos, all I'm doing here is scratching the surface so you can see things in a new light and then figure out more for yourself. I can recommend lots of books on these subjects, so let me know in the comments and I'll hook you up. The most dangerous and pervasive of conspiracy theories is about how Jews control the world. They tap into the feeling everyone with any awareness has that we don't really have a democracy, but are ruled by other people who lie to us about what they do. Most anti-Semitic conspiracy stuff takes the form of dog whistles that don't use the word Jews, but absolutely mean Jews, like globalists and cultural Marxists, the Great Replacement and the New World Order, international elites and Hollywood elites and New York intellectuals, the Rothschilds, George Soros, even lizard people and space lasers. If people believe there might be something to the conspiracy, they look more into it, and they come across websites and videos that teach them the dog whistle words really meant Jews this whole time. These sites use words like Jewish plot, which sounds sinister, and show pictures of powerful people who are Jewish and say, see, some powerful people are Jewish, as if that weren't statistically inevitable. Yeah, and most powerful people are not Jewish, so it tells us nothing. But to the conspiracy theorists, there's always someone else secretly directing things. Everyone is really a puppet of the secret group we're not allowed to talk about. This is anti-Semitism, well-packaged lies about Jews for rulers to distract people and for fascists to recruit people. Wait, elites? Globalists? Lizard people? Does this mean Alex Jones is anti-Semitic? Hey, I'm just asking questions. Just wondering aloud if Alex Jones's program was one long anti-Semitic rant set to dog whistles. Hmm. One result of a couple thousand years of anti-Semitism is we think there could be some secret global cabal making all the important decisions and undermining everything we hold dear, yet leaving no trace of their involvement. Ah. It's a kind of central conspiracy theory all the others can bud off from. Negative organs are the source of all the problems in the world. And you believe that? Well, how do you explain all the problems in the world? Anytime there's a conspiracy that we don't have any evidence of, but someone assures you it's probably definitely happening, the Jewish cabal hypothesis is likely below the surface. For instance, whenever the right wing's enemies, like racialized people, queer people, poor people, and so on, organize to resist their oppression, or even just show awareness of it, the right blames the same group of people. I'll let someone else explain it. 
Anytime a minority group, which white supremacy has been insisting is incompetent, stupid, lazy, irrelevant, childlike, unsympathetic, etc., is successful at organizing and agitating for its collective well-being in exactly the way that white supremacism insists they couldn't, white supremacy has a convenient explanation. The Jews must have put them up to it. Rich Jews must have funded it, intellectual Jews must have plotted it, powerful Jews must have used their political power to facilitate it. That would certainly explain the right-wing response to the widespread acceptance of trans people. Trans people are coming out of the closet? Must be a plot to undermine masculinity or femininity or the family or something I've been told I value anyway. People who jump into the conspiracy theory don't know what being trans is and don't want to know. They want to blame a shadowy clique controlling things behind the scenes to provide a convenient explanation for everything they don't like. Sure, there's no evidence, but since when did people require evidence for their beliefs? Trans people? More than two genders? It's a conspiracy to corrupt our children. Must be the doctors conspiring to trick children into harming themselves, possibly in league with woke teachers. Harming children is an evergreen anti-Semitic argument that dates back about 900 years, and the charge of corrupting the youth has been a way to shut people up since Socrates. People like Marjorie Taylor Greene use anti-Semitic dog whistles to rise to power. She will defend our country from the globalist elites tricking dogs into pooping on your lawn. Bigotry corrupts minds into believing nonsense and distracts from real problems. It spawns violence and helps people take power. Like all people labeled a race, Jews are an amorphous group of people held together by frayed threads of identity. Groups are rarely the problem. When you start looking at how systems as a whole work, you start to see things as more complicated than this or that identifiable group of people. Think about it this way. If we got rid of all the supposedly corrupt politicians and bureaucrats and everyone else from all the institutions and made sure they never came back, then replaced them with different people unsullied by politics, after a few months we would be right back where we started, with all the same problems not getting solved. The new people would quickly realize how power actually works, that power works for powerful people to oppress everyone else, that social problems are a source of power, so the incentive is to initiate and prolong them. Anyone who disagreed with this new old way of doing things would get relieved of office. The new rulers would consolidate power among themselves and then they wouldn't have to do any of the things they promised. No one who has power wants their subjects to have that power back in the form of freedom to make their own decisions. No, people with power want to know how they can take more power. So the problem isn't the wrong asses in the seats of power, and least of all what color they are. The problem is the existence of the seats. Seats come with incentives. If you were, say, an aspiring politician, you need money so you can campaign. So you go to the people with all the money, solicit donations, and ask what they want in return. When you take your seat, you use it to help out your campaign contributors. It's not necessarily that every bill you pass was written by your sponsors, but that you're highly unlikely to do anything against what they want you to do. We might think of politicians as powerful, but like the rest of us, if they make more powerful people angry, they're out of a job. And if you lose your seat, you're back to having no power. Politicians play a big role in determining what the bureaucracy does, so in that way, civil servants' incentives are influenced by the same money. But they are also sometimes more directly bought off by the offer of lucrative careers after they're done civilly serving. No one group of people runs or rules the world. They administer the demands of capital. So what is capital? Capital isn't just money, but money used to buy something in order to sell it again at a profit. In mainstream economics, it means something else, but that's not what I'm talking about. Capital is privately owned, usually by a small minority of the population. 
Since capitalists own the land, the factories, the stores, and have all the money, they create a whole class of people without capital, or the proletariat, who are forced to accept work from the owners of capital to survive. One law of capital is it has to keep expanding, so some portion of the surplus created gets reinvested. The effects of that law lead to other laws, like the compulsion for companies to show a profit and increase the efficiency and productivity of labor. Decisions are carried out in institutions, and today most social institutions exist to facilitate the formation of capital. Government is where power is exercised, but not necessarily where it's located. Decisions get enacted in government, but they're often made in corporate boardrooms. Capital is always trying to expand, which is always carried out by force, because no one wants to give up their land and start working in someone else's mines and plantations. As such, capital's demands might include dispossessing people and forcing them to accept wage labor, beating up striking workers, taking money from them to subsidize and bail out large corporations, inducing or pressuring other governments to lower barriers to foreign trade and investment, imposing sanctions on non-compliant governments, and even invading, occupying, and constructing a new state. Due to all those processes and more, virtually every government in the world today is designed to serve capital. That's why governments have mostly the same functions and priorities everywhere. It's why voting seems to make no difference. All the parties are parties of capital. If you want to run for office, you need to get millions of dollars from somewhere, and somewhere expects returns on investment. It's not one kind of person running things or benefiting from the system, but anyone with the money and the connections. But judges are independent, right? Well, you decide. The day before I recorded this, the DC Court of Appeals ruled that enslaving children and working them to death is just fine if it's big corporations doing it. It's not that government can't act independently of the orders it takes from capitalists. Government is the concentration of force. If it wanted to, it could lock up every billionaire and seize their assets. But <laughs> there's no incentive to. The incentives are to use that force to serve the capitalist class generally and your closest benefactors in particular. People seem to think schools and especially universities are somehow less a part of the capitalist system, possibly even an unchecked hotbed of leftist subversion. But they aren't. They're the basic medium for capitalist indoctrination. I've made a whole series on the school, but to confine this part to the topic at hand, I think of the school as a factory for turning the raw material of people into obedient, incurious, hardworking patriots who instinctively wince when they draw outside the lines. You go into school bright-eyed and full of questions, and you leave believing some people should rule you and others are your enemies. There's no better way to prepare children for the endless, unrewarding drudgery of work than getting them to sit down, shut up, and obey authority for nine hours a day. Another thing about school is it claims to teach us how the world works, but actually, it covers it up. I've been saying conspiracy theories distract us from the real problem. In our time and place, the problem is capitalism. We never learn how capitalism works in school, its violent history or present, how it creates or takes over social institutions, how it unites powerful people across national and religious divides in the goal of exploiting the rest of us. So we leave school thinking we know something about the world when really we've been trained to believe stuff rather than observe for ourselves. But maybe you knew that about government and school already, certainly if you've been on this channel long enough. Have you ever considered the family as a tool of capital? The family as a closed unit is not universal, but historically specific. The family has taken innumerable forms over the millions of years. You can learn a little bit about it here, and there are a couple of links in the description. Nuclear families are designed as hierarchies, with the patriarch on top. The man works for money, the woman works to make it possible for the man to work and have kids. Property is transmitted down the male line. Wealth would stay private that way. 
Some of that's changed recently, of course. The patriarch could be two parents of any gender, because now we recognize any adult can dominate and abuse a child. A hierarchy transmits values like discipline, so kids learn to fear and obey the parent, then the teacher, the boss, and the cop. To accept hierarchy as normal, to internalize other people's rules, to prepare for a life of doing what they're told. In the family, they learn to consume and to base their identity and worth on what they consume. Advertisers target children for the power they have to manipulate their parents into buying things. Because if you love your children, or just want them to stop screaming, you'll buy them the latest thing kids are into. Even if these are new revelations, they should make sense to you. The thing the most powerful people care most about is capital, so they mold society to serve it. If you wanted a society organized for, say, compassion, joy, pleasure, fun, freedom, you would need to end capitalism, or at least carve out a defensible territory for yourself somewhere. Because in a world of capital, most people's job is to reproduce capital. And you're only allowed happiness in that tiny gap between work and sleep. So there's a conspiracy, but it's mostly out in the open. A matter of public record. Remember I said even you're in on it? When we work for capitalist corporations or other institutions, our job is to reproduce capital for the capitalist class to accumulate. When we shop from corporations, we're giving them money they will use to expand their power over us. Every law passed, every budget approved is the result of conspiring among powerful people to continue the systems of oppression they benefit from. Sure, we don't know exactly what was said at which meeting, but we can see the results in front of our eyes. We live in a world of war, poverty, prison, mass surveillance, and sophisticated propaganda to make it all normal. You don't need conspiracy theories to see that. Of course the wealthy are lying to us. They own the corporate media and the public relations firms. The rich and powerful aren't one ethnic or religious group because there are wealthy people in every country cooperating and competing to carve up the world among them. 2,000 years on, anti-Semitism is still helping them draw attention away from their own actions. Now, I'm against capitalism mostly because of the social hierarchy it creates and strengthens. Capitalism means slavery, wage labor, police, prisons, and poverty, not to mention the constant destruction of the environment. I'm against all those things. So when critical thinkers with creative ideas suggest moving to North Korea, they might not realize I don't want that either. I want a world without social hierarchy and oppression and the violence that come with it. You can imagine such a world and find people around you who are building it. We exist. We're doing mutual aid in your community. We're confronting the state and the right wing in the streets. You just got to look for us. Anything we do to disrupt the processes of capitalism has an effect, whether it's smashing windows at a bank or blocking arms shipments. And the more of us there are, the better our chances of succeeding. See you out there.